Hey everybody, Jason here. I hope you're all doing really, really, really good. I just want to reach out and say that uh, I'm okay. I'm still here. I haven't recorded a video in about five months. We have been extremely busy. The pandemic has caused tons and tons of devices to be flooding in. Um, I've literally been through hundreds of phones since my last video, but that's not the reason why I haven't been posting. That kind of, uh, I, I'm not going to really talk about that too much on YouTube, but I am really looking forward to getting back into the swing of things. Today, I'm working on an iPhone 8 that was sent here uh, from Germany. This is a warranty job. I repaired it, sent it back to them, and whenever they got it back, the phone came on just like briefly and then went off. Now, against my better judgment, this is a liquid damaged iPhone 8, but the liquid damage wasn't very bad. And also against my better judgment, this is a prior repair attempt. Only the prior repair attempt wasn't that bad. So I agreed with the customer that we would fully repair this phone. So let me show you what it is that I am up against. First, I'm gonna to read to you exactly what I did to the phone. So here we are looking at the original job where this phone came in for repair. As you can see here, I repaired the logic board, charged them 150 bucks for that. Logic board is a prior repair attempt. Chestnut slash display power management has significant damage. Replace TI slash chestnut IC. Replace damage slash missing surrounding components. Test clean insulate repair. So this was a pretty typical botched up repair, but it wasn't that bad. And then also this phone had a bad screen assembly and didn't light up the backlight. I'm sure that really trolled the last guy as they looked like they were trying to fix backlight. So I charged them 50 bucks to replace the screen assembly. That's actually pretty typical for a board repair for me. When I've already charged them for a board repair and the phone needs just a little bit more, um, I don't really charge an elevated price for replacing the screen assembly. So as you can see, this board has my work showing down here at the bottom. I replaced a handful of components here along the bottom end of the board and also uh, some of these components over here. And then um, the TI slash chestnut chip is right here. This is our display power management IC. Now, I did not cut the shield off the bottom of this phone. I mean, this was, uh, this was like this whenever it came in. I do not cut this shield off for pretty much anything. I mean, it's really rare that I actually remove that anywhere. So you can see here that my work here is really clean. And although these components didn't uh, normally have insulation on them from the factory, I still put green UV mask on them just to kind of keep it sort of protected against like uh, future liquid damage. And plus I'm, I'm kind of compulsive with green UV mask. So let's go ahead and hook this thing to a DC power supply and see what we are getting. We're gonna connect a lead. Let's not connect that one. So we're gonna connect our dock flex, connect our battery and we're gonna turn the power supply on. So before boot prompt, you can see that we are drawing 10 milliamps. That is completely acceptable. Now I'm gonna press the button to boot and one, two, three, boot. Aha, now instantly this thing is drawing two amps of current. That is way too much current for an initial button press. We should get, you know, 80 or 100 milliamps, a brief pause, followed by a boot sequence. So what that tells me is that this board, it has a short somewhere. Initially to troubleshoot this, I know you all like to see me like burning my fingers and stuff, but I have came to do most of these types of things using a thermal camera. And as you all know, I have become quite fond of my FLIR One Pro which I purchased myself and this has been been like one of my number one tools for troubleshooting this stuff. Today we're going to be using a Seek Compact Pro that was sent here by iPad Rehab. This was sent here for free and I am supposed to do a product review on it. Now I'm not actually going to do a review on it. We're just going to use it to fix stuff. Um, and I expect that this is going to be like my number one used camera. Main reason being the FLIR One Pro, this thing has an internal battery and even if it's like at 27% or 20%, it'll just like shut off for no reason. And uh, I'm not sure what it'll take to replace the battery in this, but I suspect it's going to need a battery replacement, which I think is just kind of nuts. And then my other complaint about this thing is that uh, they watermark every single picture and video that you take with it, and there's no way to adjust that. So whenever I post videos on YouTube, I'm always covering up that stinking watermark because I don't agree that it's there. You pay $400 for a camera, why watermark it, for crying out loud? So I'm going to flip this board upside down here. 
so that we can get a good look at the bottom of it. So we're going to load up the Seek Thermal software. And connect the camera. Okay, so right away we're getting a, um, a readout on thermal stuff. And one thing that I really like about this camera right off the bat is that it has a much better frame rate than the FLIR 1 Pro. Even on this old Android tablet, I mean, the frame rate is actually pretty decent. Now, Jessa also sent to me this uh, macro lens. This lens, I believe, is supposed to just slip right over the existing lens on the Seek camera. I think maybe I'm using it wrong, like maybe I'm supposed to take off this rubber or something because it don't exactly fit down on their flush. But to be 100% honest, uh, this thing works pretty good without it. So let me show you what it is that we're looking at and let's see if we can use it to fix this board. So here we are looking at this board with the thermal camera and it doesn't have the MSX that the Flare 1 Pro has. So it doesn't really give you a, a real clear visual combined with thermal, but honestly you don't need it. So I'm gonna turn the power supply on and I'm gonna press the button to boot. And one, two, three, boot, boom. Okay, I'm going to turn the power supply off. We'll let that board cool down just a little bit more. Yeah, now right off, right off the bat, I'm going to point with my finger here so maybe you can see it on the thermal. We've seen the PMIC get hot. There was a little area up here around the boost IC that got hot, but then also down here next to NAND, there was an area that got hot. Let's watch that one more, once more. We're going to press the button to boot, and one, two, three, boot. Boom. Okay, so my cable's getting hot. We've got an area here next to NAND getting hot, PMIC, and then also Boost IC. So with the thermal camera, we've quickly narrowed down several things that are heating up. Now, this type of short that happens after button press, it can be a little bit difficult to narrow down because other stuff gets hot first, mostly the PMIC. The Boost IC gets hot. So if you're feeling around with your hands, it can be a little bit misleading to try to figure out where the heat's coming from. And also with some of these caps that are a really firm short, the actual short itself doesn't make a whole lot of heat anyways. So I did that without this macro lens. And honestly, you can see pretty good without the macro lens. Wear out on the board is getting hot. So I'm gonna come back to this and look at this uh, at a different time. I know I think I'm just using it wrong. I'm not able to get that clear of an image through this lens, but people swear by this thing. I know I'm using it wrong. So let's get back under the microscope. Let's have a look at this bottom corner of NAND. Now, this is a short that I am very much familiar with. And if we turn this board up on its side and get it in the focus, we will see that there is just the tiniest little bit of liquid that got here, but the caps themselves through the coating doesn't look that bad. So we're gonna go ahead and pick some of this off of here and see if we can figure out if this is the problem. It most likely is. I suspect that we have a shorted NAND cap. Oh yeah, look at this one here. You can see that this cap has gotten significant corrosion on it and it almost looks like the solder is bubbly. Let's go ahead and pick the one off next to it. And this one looks really good. So I think we have pretty well narrowed down where the actual short is on this board. Let's go ahead and have a look at, for this I'm gonna use phone board. I prefer to use flex board view because the interface is just completely awesome, but I don't actually have a good board view file for the iPhone 8. Um, it is there, but it's blank, I guess. We are gonna zoom in on the portion of this board that I suspect to be at fault. And we have these two caps down here, and it looks like the cap on the left looks worse. And if we select that line, these two caps, they're both actually on the same line. And this is going to be, although I don't have net names on this board, this is going to be a NAND line, most likely 3V0, uh, just because that is the most common. So let's go ahead and check that with a multimeter. Now I'm gonna be using this meter in diode mode, just because I've came to really like diode mode. We can also, let's just check it both ways. We'll do diode mode 
and also resistance mode. So with diode mode, I'm going to put my red probe on ground, and I'm going to put my black probe on our line here that we suspect is shorted. Oh, and look at there, we're getting 0, 0.00 voltage drop to ground. Now, if we check this in resistance mode, this should be somewhere pretty dang close to zero ohms. So I'm gonna put my black probe on ground and use my red probe to do the probing. And as you can see, we are getting 1.1 ohm arenes to ground. So that is without a doubt uh, where we're getting our short. Now, um, I can understand why a short on one of these lines would cause the PMIC to immediately heat up but it's still a little bit of a mystery to me why the boost IC gets hot. I don't know, maybe I should spend some more time studying, I guess. So let's disconnect the power supply here. And I'm gonna get this board in a holder. You can see my well-used holder. Now to take this goop off the board, I'm gonna set my hot air to my lowest setting here, which is 235C, airflow of 75. I'm not sure what everybody else uses, but this is what I use. And then I'm gonna use one of my handy dandy pick tools here. And carve this out a bit. Now if I was just going to yank this off the board and leave it, I wouldn't carve it out at all, but we are going to actually do a proper repair on this. Now before I clean this up right next to the NAND too much, I like to use some of that coating as um, a barrier to keep me from cracking anything but I'm actually going to insert my blade right here next to it and push down. And there we go, it pops that right off the board. Gosh, I haven't... Uh, I haven't recorded and let me tell you it is very difficult to get back to something once you've been away for so long. It's like, this is sort of my ice breaking video, but man my nerves sure show it, boy. Alright, so let's take this down a little farther here along man. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna turn my hot air up a little bit more now. I've just set myself to 340 degrees C with an airflow of 4T. And we're gonna add a little bit of flux. And I'm gonna use my micro pencil here with some leaded solder. And I'm gonna take up these little stragglers here that have been left behind on the pads. Okay, I'm going to do just a little bit more flux because there's a smidgen, just a smidgen more solder there than I would care to see. That's going to be about as good as we get it. All right, so we've got some nice domes on there. And now we are going to use a brand spanking new capacitor. I'm not exactly sure what the value of that capacitor is. However, I'm going to be using a 10 microfarad 6.3 volt capacitor. So here is our brand spanking new capacitor. This is actually one of the largest components that I use. I know it don't look very big, but it is actually big, promise you. And now, we're going to get this on the board. So I'm going to just... Crap, I dropped it. Seriously? All right, so let's get this right on down in. We're going to sit this just in there like that and kind of push on it to get it stuck in our flux. You stick in the flux. I'm trying to do a video. Okay, let's start warming this thing up. Hopefully I don't blow it away. As the flux heats up, it'll become much more willing to stick where it's supposed to.
Now I'm kind of moving my hot air side to side to try to heat up this whole area of the board. I don't like to just like spot heat one spot because it can cause flexing and cracking and things like that. All right, there we go. We're going to warm it right on up and this cap will shimmy down into place one side. And then the other. There we go. It's not the straightest cap in the world, but it is a soldered cap, by the way. Now, with this board still hot, I'm going to go ahead and clean up the flux that I have on here. One, because I don't like to leave a bunch of flux behind. I like to put the coating back on the board. And two, so I can see and make sure we don't have any bridging on either side of it. Okay, now that looks really good. Let's have a little bit of a closer look. And that cap is soldered very, very well on both sides. Now my next step, something that I do with pretty much every single repair, uh, depending on where the component is and why the component's there, is I go ahead and apply some green UV mask. So here is my green UV mask. If you buy a tube of this stuff, it will most likely last you basically forever. The nozzle that comes on this any nozzle that you can put on it is just way, way, way too big. So I just take me a nice uh, toothpick here and, and, and get it in there real good there. Make sure it's nice and moist and pull it out. And we've got some gooey, gooey green UV mask. So you can see how big that toothpick is compared to those components. I actually take the tip of an X-Acto blade and I just sort of dip it in what's on that toothpick. And this is what I use to coat these components. Uh, anything else is just too big. And my mask is a little bit uh, thickened up here. It should be a lot more, a lot more runny. Now this step really just isn't necessary. This is something that I do, you know, they come from Apple and they have this on here, not UV mask, but they've got a conformal coating over these components. And this coating will often save these boards from components getting liquid damaged. I know it, it didn't actually save this board, but um, sometimes it does. So now that we have the UV mask applied to the board, this glue, it does not set up, it does not get hard until it has UV light. So for that, we're going to use a nice strong UV lamp and I'm going to sit this right here on the board and give that a moment to cool. Uh, I mean, give that a moment to cure. All right, so this has been on here for a little while and our glue should be cured up. Let's have a look at that under the microscope and see what it looks like. Nice and pretty. And again, I don't really have a good reason why I do that, other than the fact that Apple did that and so many times liquid will come in through the sim tray gets on these components and I believe that sometimes that'll actually prevent the phone from being damaged. So let's go ahead and test this thing. I'm going to be using an iPhone 7 screen to test this. However, we will not connect the home button because the connector for the home button from the iPhone 7 to the iPhone 8, although it looks pretty much identical, they are just a fuzz different. So we will connect our screen assembly. Connect our power supply. And we are going to turn the power supply on and press the button to boot in one, two, three. Boot. 80 milliamps. This is good. And we have Apple logo. This phone is booting. So this is a really, really, really straightforward repair. But I think the only way that I would have like efficiently found that shorted cap is if I used free spray. And one thing that I really don't like about free spray, especially here in Florida, is that once you freeze the entire board, the condensation is just it is massive. You wind up with, you know, the whole entire board is soaked. It's just like dunking it in distilled water. So if you're going to use free spray and then switch directly to hot air and solder something, you have to make sure the board's like absolutely dry. Or you could popcorn chips, RAM can swell, all sorts of bad things can happen. 
So as you can see here, we have a phone that is booted and it is ready to accept a passcode. Now, there is one more thing on this board that I am really concerned about. This thing, it has already came here all the way from Germany. I shipped it all the way back all the way back to Germany when he got it. It would not. I mean, it came on for just a brief moment and then was dead. The person that cut the shield off of this, and I can't even believe that I let this slip past me the last time, but looking again at the bottom side of this board, you can see that this chip down here has a chunk gone out of it. And it also seems to be like right on one of these manufacturer lines where I just... You know, we've got this line leading up here to the chip, and then there's this chunk missing, which that little bit of a crack, it doesn't affect the chip much at all as far as, like, um, being functional. But after being sent back from uh, Germany, I'm just, I don't want to leave anything on this board that could possibly cause this thing to come back to me again. Like, I'm sure this will be fine. But after the phone takes a hard drop, that chip is going to be one of the first ones to crack. So we're going to go ahead and replace it. I actually don't have any, any of those in stock. So I'm going to grab a iPhone 8 donor board. And we're going to harvest this one of these and swap that chip out real quick. So this board looking like absolute hell. Seems to be a perfect candidate. And I like seeing that we have pin 1 pleasantly marked up here at the top corner. Uh, let's go ahead and harvest this chip. I'm going to turn my hot air up to 430 degrees C with an airflow of 40. And these boards, they take quite a bit of heat whenever you're dealing with the lead-free solder. So that's why I've turned the hot air up so high. And we're just going to warm this up. Oh, look, it popped right off. Have I had that off the board before? Holy smokes. Huh, okay. Let's go ahead and move this thing over to reballing station B here and lay this on the table. Now, for larger ICs. Okay, so I just finished reballing the IC that I salvaged from another board, and I've actually just installed it on this. And I look up and it's not recording. Like, ah! So let me just show you what this looks like. Um, I have put a brand banking new IC on here with nice, shiny, beautiful, symmetrical, non-leaded, or wait, leaded, non-hairy balls. And I feel much more secure about this because it's uh, it's not cracked. And let me tell you, I have a conscience. I like to be able to sleep at night. And if I had sent this back with that cracked IC on the board, now having seen and fully realized that that was cracked so badly, I wouldn't have been able to sleep at night. So I don't have a passcode to fully test this, but um, I would like to test and make sure that it does still power on. I would like to make sure that we have good current um, and that is no phantom drains and no, no crazy business going on. So here's our board. We're going to connect it back to the power supply. I'm going to connect up a test screen. There we are. And now we're going to turn the power supply on and press the button to boot in one, two, three. Boot. I cannot believe I didn't record that reballing process. I actually got into it too, like, ah. All right, so we're gonna let this boot up. I'm gonna make sure we still have working touch. Um, our current drain is completely normal. Let me turn it back here so you can actually see our current. Dun, 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 dun. Any minute now. Of course, now you know it's going to troll me since I'm actually recording. And there we go. We are up to a passcode screen with working touch. And this is going to be a happy customer. So my next step from here is to get in touch with the customer and see if I can get them to cough up the passcode because I would really, really, really like to test this before sending it all the way back to Germany. The chip that I replaced on the bottom of here, it's somewhat more intricate than just like replacing a shorted cap somewhere. Anyways, guys, that is going to be the end of this video. I really want to thank everybody that has stuck with me through my extended downtime and also all of the shops that continue to refer customers here and all of the people that continue to send phones here. I'm just... I cannot say how grateful I am. So um, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon. Have a good day.